The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. As Jesus and his disciples went on their way, Jesus entered a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. Our scripture reading this morning are filled with an overabundance of material that we could reflect upon that time doesn't allow just to touch briefly on some of it. I would surmise that many of you on your kitchen tables might have a basket of fruit, a basket of summer fruit, as begins our first lesson today. You can identify with that, the wonderful fragrances and color of, and freshness of a summer fruit basket. The prophet Amos lived among a group of shepherds and was a dresser of sycamore trees. So he knew and appreciated a basket of fruit more than anyone. He also knew that ripe summer fruit rots quickly. That's the warning he was giving to the privileged people of Israel. In a talk at the Faith and Politics Institute in Washington, D.C., Thomas Cahill described the prophets as inconvenient party poopers. He said, Amos is the first in a long line of Hebrew prophets who tell the people the truth, however unwelcome, about how they actually stand with God. While the privileged class was enjoying a time of wealth, stability, and prosperity, Amos warned them that it wouldn't last, at least if they continued to uphold religious and moral corruption, take advantage of and oppress the less privileged, and only look out for themselves. Amos knew that just as the Nile rises and subsides, so does wealth and privilege, which leads to a tossing about of God's judgment. God will punish injustice with wrath and bitterness. In the psalm, David was writing in reaction to a personal betrayal, fearing for his life in Saul's court after yet another attempted murder. David took refuge in the home of Ahimelech, the high priest. The chief herdsman informed Saul that David had taken refuge with Ahimelech and accused the priest of confederacy with a traitor. Saul responded by ordering Doeg himself to kill all the priests. David was clearly angry and wrote his reaction in this psalm, Psalm 52. But besides anger and despair, in the midst of all of his sorrows, David also finds joy. 
He triumphs and rejoices, full of life like a green olive tree, and gives thanks. He writes his anger into his song, blasting those who betray and mock. But David also uses his individual circumstance as an illustration of choices that we make every day. One can take refuge in God or in riches of power and wealth. For individuals or nations, the choice to live with God will make us give thanks and rejoice. In the epistle, in his letter to the Colossians, Paul addresses rumors of heresy by reminding these new Christians of the basics of their faith. Christ is central, and Paul knows that if the Colossians understand who Christ was and what his mission and purpose were, then they will have a firm theological footing on which to deal with real-life temptations and conflict. Christ will bring unity between people and between humanity and creation and God. And in the Gospel, we have the story of Mary and Martha, which brings up a question of identity and roles. Martha accuses Mary not only of not helping to serve dinner, but for sitting at Jesus' feet. Women were not permitted to receive religious instruction under the rabbinical law, but some nevertheless persisted. By sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his teachings, Mary demonstrated bravery in transgressing the deep-seated prohibition of women in the role of the disciple. Both Mary and Martha are disciples. They prioritize in each of their ways the true meaning of ministry listen and learn and be changed by the word of God. Now Phil Hooper, an Episcopal priest, has written about this and says that we might, after reading this gospel, fall into trying to answer a trick question. A trick question. Are you a Mary or are you a Martha? If you've ever spent spent time hearing interpretations of this gospel, you probably understand the dichotomy implicit in the question. Martha, we often say, is the active one, rushing around, busying herself with the demanding practicalities of life. Mary, on the other hand, is the contemplative one, resting attentively at Jesus' feet, engaged in a more conventionally prayerful, intellectual encounter with her Lord. Two sisters, two followers of Jesus, and we are told two diverging possibilities for discipleship, with Mary's prayerful receptivity being the better part, and therefore the one to which we are taught to aspire. And so when we hear Luke's gospel in this story today, we might ask ourselves, which one are you, Martha or Mary? Busy or mindful, striving or tranquil. Perhaps as you hear the question, you can already feel the pressure of having the right answer, of measuring up, of choosing that better part. But before you get too lost in all that, remember what was said at the outset. It's a trick question. It's a false choice. It is false quite simply because it is not the choice that Jesus, by way of this test, asks us to make. Jesus is not pitting the sisters against one another, nor is he creating a hierarchy of modes of discipleship. The dichotomies that we read into the text are our own fabrications, born of our own desire to render the world intelligible through categories and labels. We do this all the time in ways both benign, like, like the roles we take in a group of friends, 
and also destructive, like the stereotypes that continue to harm people at the margin. This is not Jesus' agenda. When he tells Martha that Mary has chosen the better part, he is not challenging Martha's personality, nor is he even rejecting Martha's present busyness, but is instead gently calling her back to the fullness of herself, reminding her of both the ground of her being and the teleos, the purposeful endpoint of all of this good, hard, and necessary work, namely, himself. Martha lives and serves, as we all do, in the name of Jesus, the one who has knocked upon her door and who now abides in the midst of her activities. It is his holy name that imbues her practical work with luminous significance. The cooking and the cleaning and the mending and the tending of small daily things. All of this holds the possibility of divine inbreak, but only when those things are done in mindfulness of God's ever-present love. That mindfulness is what we must bring to the table as disciples. And so Jesus simply wants Martha not to lose sight of it, knowing as he does how easy it is to become worried and distracted by many things. What he offers then is not a competition between Mary and Martha as types of greater and lesser discipleship, nor a distinction between the relative virtues of being and doing, but instead a continuous and crucial choice that each of us are called to make in all that we do between remembering Jesus or forgetting him. This is a gospel story that calls us to remember. This is a gospel story in which Martha is asked, as we are, to do this, all of this, everything, in remembrance of Him. And how we need to remember, and we need this reminder, especially now, caught up as we are in the continuous maelstrom of those many things that trouble the world around us. How tempting it can be to look at the state of the world, or even the state of the church, and to feel a low-grade panic rise in our throats, repeating to ourselves like a mantra or a plea, more to be done, more to be done, more to be done. And of course there is more to be done, much more, and much of it will be different from what we have done before and what we have been before. The kingdom requires us to roll up our sleeves, but as we do so, as we make our lists and tend to the cracks and the spills and the dusty corners of our days, we cannot forget that we do not act by ourselves or for ourselves. We do so in the name of Jesus. We do so in and through the power of his peace. This is what Martha needed to remember. And it is a necessary reminder whenever we sit down as individuals or as a community, to consider who we are and where we are going. We must ask ourselves not only what to do, but why and for whom. Why do we work so hard to keep our faith communities healthy? Why do we persist with our traditions in the midst of widespread apathy and violence? Why do we dare to dream of a world that is guided by love and justice, when too often we see a world hardened and burdened by fear and inequality? The answer cannot simply be, as Episcopalians love, often love to say, because they've always done it that way. <laughs> the answer must be Jesus. We work hard because of Jesus. We persist because of Jesus. We dare to dream because of Jesus. We cannot forget this. We cannot forget him, no matter what we do. We're not given in this gospel story Martha's response to the Lord. It would not really make much sense, though, to infer that she suddenly dropped all of her work at that moment and sat alongside her sister. After all, there were still mouths to feed, 
Still places to be set at the table. Still broken fragments of this or that to be gathered up and repaired. There are still all of these things to be done. And there always will be. And thanks be to God for the grace we are each given to do the necessary unglamorous work that sustains us. It is holy work done upon the holy ground that is, in fact, everywhere once we remember to look for it. So, no, you are not a Martha. You are not a Mary. All of us are both of them and neither. For love requires us sometimes to strive and other times to be still. They are not separate paths but merely the varied landscape of the single way back home. You are a follower of Jesus. You are a servant of Jesus. You are a lover of Jesus. That is not a trick question. Jesus is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. Amen.